Again, thank you very much for taking time out of your uh, busy campaign schedule to come join us this afternoon. Uh, I'm John Paris. I'm the one that was sending out all those emails and responding to, to yours as well. Um, John, I, I know you've interviewed with us before, but JT, you have not, correct? It's my first time. Give you a little, little background on us. The Asian American Group is somewhat of an umbrella organization for numerous other or Asian organizations throughout the Valley. Um, we've been doing interviews for approximately six years now for various political races. Um, what we'll do is as follows. We're going to have a makeup day on Thursday for Mr. Holder, as well as the other individuals who cannot be present today for our interviews. Uh, we'll, we plan on having our endorsements go out on Friday uh, of next week or of, of this week. We know that early voting does start on Saturday, so we want to get this information out as quickly as we can. When we endorse the individuals for the various races, we don't. We, not only do we contact the people on the email list, but we also get ad space donated to us in various Asian periodicals. We print up slate cards and leave them at various Asian businesses throughout the valley. As well, we have, excuse me, several thousand email addresses between all of us here. And we send that out. We know this is a, a non-election year. It's a well, I shouldn't say non-election, but. It's an off-cycle year, yeah. and it's a primary, so <clears throat> there aren't a lot of sexy races out there. So it is important. You know, every vote will count. It's magnified now, so we try and get out as much information to our fellow Asians as possible. That having been said, um, the first question we've been asking most in most races, and I've all started with the person furthest to my left. So JT, you get to go first, and then John, you'll get a chance to answer is why have you decided to run for this particular seat at this particular time? Sure thing. Thank you for the question. Um, you know, I've gone through a lot of the struggles that the working families of District 10 have gone through over the past six to seven years in the recession. Uh, you worried about how you're going to pay your bills, dealing with unexpected medical expenses. My family themselves have lost a business, lost a home. So I, I know a lot of the struggles a lot of folks have been going through. I've lived them personally, and I've been up to the past several sessions. First as a, a student activist fighting against education and working on a number of different bills. So I know how to pass common sense legislation. Uh, I, I understand the issues and how they impact people uh, in, in the district. And I'm really excited about the opportunity right now. I think things are starting to turn around. I see some hope on the horizon. And I'd really like to have a seat at the table where I can uh, bring the concerns of the folks in District 10 and it kind of influence the direction. I think we're at a point where we're redefining what it means to be from Nevada. Uh, I think a lot of the folks that are here now are less transient than they were, say, 10 years ago. They're much more committed to staying here and raising their families here and making sure that we can have a, a better quality education system, healthcare system, and a diverse economy. And I want to have an opportunity to have a part of shaping that future. Okay, John. I've lived here for over 11 years. I moved here from back east. And what I have endured and witnessed sickens me. One of the attractions to move here was the lower cost of living. Over the past couple of years, that is eluding us. As I said earlier, the cost of electricity is skyrocketing, and you haven't seen anything yet. The cost of water. The Water Authority went on a spending binge with no oversight. They are now in debt to three billion, billion dollars. Two billion in debt in bonds and close to a billion in the new intake tunnel. There's been no real long term plan. They've gone and bought all this land up north to drill and pump water down here. Great idea. The only problem was they didn't realize the ranchers up there don't want it. So they've expended all this money for something they may or may not be able to get out of the ground. Uh, the um, other issue that I see is lack of accountability by state agencies. I'm one of the commissioners on the Common Interest Community Commission, otherwise known as an HOA. I have personally intervened and saved three elderly people's homes from being foreclosed. All This is all as a non advocate. Uh, I wish you did real estate law because I 
get you to do some pro bono work on behalf of these people. Usually they're elderly, usually they're females. And uh, one of them, 80 year old man, John Raduca, no mortgage, pays his assessment six months in advance, and yet they were trying to steal his home. They got up Darcy Spears to do the story on him. They broadcasted it all of a sudden. The board didn't know where, of his association, didn't know where to run and hide. Another woman, 78-year-old uh, Lillian Bossel, Southern Highlands, got that turned around. Uh, she had a dead pad, patch of grass about the size of this. She has a master association and a sub uh, association. $6,000 fine between the two of them. This nonsense has got to stop. Your uh, lack of affinity for HOAs is, is well documented. I recall speaking with you previously, and, and your website did highlight that. But one thing you had referenced earlier was uh, the issue of accountability. Assuming you're elected, what assurances can you give to maintain you know, open lines of communication so that you can be held accountable to your constituents and your fellow Nevadans in general? And cool. obviously you'll have the same opportunity. It's called cool. voting. That's why I said non-elected. A couple of officials that I know where the statute is very clear that they had to do certain things. It took me two years. The statute said 60 days, two years to get a response. And the only reason I got the response was I embarrassed this person in front of somebody much higher up. One other thing I failed to mention was the corruption corruption in the commission itself. I exposed it. Uh, it was the, um, the summary of it. I should have brought it forward to you, but I can email it. On the Review Journal, March 6th, Sean Whaley wrote about it. When uh, I discovered last fall, the commission had no authority in statute to do what they did, which was costing every single person in this room tax dollars, was millions and millions of dollars that was being taken illegally by the collection companies. You didn't even know it. You were being policed. Anyway, the uh, commission didn't want to vote on it, so the decision was let's pass it off to the Attorney General's office, get a response, a decision. That decision came down in February. Three of the commissioners on February 27th refused to rescind this illegal advisory opinion. Three of us said it had to be rescinded. We each, as commissioners, took an oath of office to uphold the laws of the state. Those three commissioners told the state, go to hell. The very next day, the governor removed those three commissioners. What did that say? There were millions of dollars involved in this. And that's why those three commissioners who make their living off of HOAs didn't want to touch it. I personally have gone through hell with my own homeowners association. I put my checkbook where my mouth was, and three times, probably four, I won. There were two big battles, though. And, and, it, ones. and, and it sounds like you'll, assuming elected, will continue to do so That's one up of in Carson. That's one of the issues. Okay. <clears throat> So you're saying how are we how are we remain accountable for Correct. Uh, somewhat of a it, it can dovetail into transparency in government or just your open door policy. We intentionally ask somewhat open ended questions to kinda okay. let you guide us where you're thinking. Well, you know, I really got started in the political world as an organizer, uh, working on campaigns, uh, I ran a nonprofit that got youth involved in civic engagement, community service and a student leader in college, uh, uh, leading big student actions, uh, fighting against budget cuts to get to go out higher education. Um, so, you know, for, for me, it's always been about getting on the ground and talking to people. That's something I've done throughout the course of this campaign, is to actually go and go to the door, talk to everybody I can, and meet with people face to face and hear their issues personally. And that's something that I don't, I don't want to stop with the election. There's uh, some folks in the legislature now who they walk every day, even during the session, they come back during the weekends and they're still there. And that's something I'd like to continue having town hall meetings, having those conversations, because sometimes we get lost up in the legislature in Carson City talking about the issues in an abstract way, and we're only hearing uh, the views of the, the issues from the folks that can camp themselves up in Carson City, which tend to be 
be the people that can afford it. And that doesn't necessarily represent our constituency. So uh, trying to maintain a constant communication and an active conversation with the folks that I intend to represent, I think is, is the most important way uh, to remain accountable to them in the best representation. One of the issues that uh, touches all of us is that of education. Okay, from an economic standpoint, from a, a personal or family related standpoint, what ideas do you have short term to begin uh, lifting us up from the 49th and a half worst state in the nation status that we currently enjoy? You know, this is a particular passion for me. It's one of the, the driving things that got me into this. You know, there, there are so many different ideas out there that I think there's large agreement, bipartisan agreement on, on where investments need to be made in EOL funding and, and early childhood development, small class sizes. Uh, but it, you know, it comes out to how we're going to pay for these things. And I think there's two things that we can do. Uh, uh, one, very in the very immediate future, and that is uh, fix our funding formula. It hasn't changed since 1967. This was an entirely different state then. And it definitely works to the disadvantage of the schools in, in our district um, that are some of the oldest, poorest schools and have the largest need for a student, but the funding is not weighted for individual student needs. There's a lot of conversation about that. We have the interim committee, so I think there is a lot of movement behind changing that. I think we can change that in the next session and get a more equitable funding stream so that uh, it, just the way that we're funding schools is actually representing uh, student need. Um, of course, we're also going to have to look at other options like the road routing, the tax base somehow, bringing all the players to the table and finding a way to do that. Uh, and then also dealing with infrastructure. There's so many schools that are over capacity. I, I drive down the street where I live at the end of Booth Pike Elementary, and all I see at the end of the street is portable after portable after portable. And it's very hard to get anything done when you have to have a, a bond measure to go to the ballot. Everybody knows that we need to fix it, but nobody wants to vote on it. So we still, we've got to come up with a solution for that. That's a little bit more longer term. But I think in the immediate future, we can do something about the funding How do you feel about vouchers? Uh, you know, I, I'm not a, a supportive of vouchers. You know, I am, uh, in any way that we can promote uh, uh, different charter options, uh, let, letting students know that what their, or letting parents know what their options are for their kids. But uh, I think that public dollars need to be reserved for public institutions first until they can succeed. Uh, uh, I, I like to keep the dollars in the public system. John, I guess two questions then, short term educational improvements and the voucher question. What Mr. Creedon has to say is all well and good, but it's not going to work. The reality is nobody up in Carson City wants it's a lady here, um, has the guts to stick their neck out. What I would like to do, number one, is have a um, accounting of where the Clark County School District is spending their money. What I've heard is an enormous amount of money is going into the administrative end. I wanted to cut that administrative budget and move it into the classroom, move it into buying books. Now, I taught for a number of years at CSN, and I had to go and do the copying of the handouts for the students because the school didn't have the money for me to do the copying with their facilities. That would be the short-term answer. Second short-term answer is stop spending money on high-priced consultants. Over a period of years, they spent $103 million. Do you realize how many books and how much uh, increase in teachers' salaries that could buy? The answer is very simple, a lot. <coughs> Another important aspect of this is they've got to get the parents involved in the kids' non-school days. I have been walking door to door in some very poor neighborhoods, and at 4.35 o'clock, young kids come to the door. Is your mom, your dad home? No, they're at work. Or else they're out the street playing. They're not doing the homework. So until you can break this cycle, get the parents involved, sitting down with the kids, making sure they're doing their homework. I remember when I was in public school 100 years ago, my mother would say to me, you can't play, go out and play, until your homework is done. As far as vouchers are concerned, I have 
have no objection to the charter schools as long as the parents of, uh, are absorbing the cost because it lessens the burdens on the school district. So you just take some hypothetical uh, numbers. You have 100,000, you no, you have 10,000 kids in a private school. Well, that's 10,000 kids less that you have in a public school. So you would have more uh, overcrowding as far as using the um, portables. They're not portable. They're not part of the main structure, but they are safe. Fire department, building department would never allow them to exist or be used unless they were safe. Uh, prior to coming out here, 11 years ago, the last big job I did in, uh, back in New York was a $20 million school addition. And uh, they had portables in the schoolyard, but they got the funding and up went the, the new $20 million building. So, uh, and the other issue, as I said to you earlier, if people can't afford the cost of electric and the cost of water, we don't have to worry about education. There's nobody going to be able to live here. Another thing I forgot to mention earlier was that our voices, if you make a big enough stink, I was part of the group that got us the right to opt out for the smart meters. I don't know how many endless meetings I attended at the PUC. And eventually, they saw the light. And now, they're coming back. NV Energy is coming back at us. They want more money because of the smart meters. The feds gave them $138 million supposedly to install all these, it's not enough. I don't have a smart meter, I opted out. It's costing me $58 to take off my original, uh, perfectly working digital analog meter, I'm sorry, not uh, an analog, and put back a refurbished one. And uh, I think it's $8 a month extra. I will be filing a class action lawsuit against NV Energy because in our current tariff, we are being charged for a meter reader. Now they're double charging us. And those of you that have a digital smart meter are not getting a credit for that meter reader. There is, and I'm sorry, if other people want to jump in, feel mm -hmm. free. Yeah. Ron? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Ron. Uh, Besides being part of AEG, uh, we also represent. Can you speak louder? Okay. Yeah. We also mm -hmm. represent yeah. over 3,500 of our most vulnerable citizens of the state. I'm the vice president of the Adult Residential Care Providers of Nevada. We have uh, over 350 providers right now. Are these the group homes? Yes, the group homes. Uh, we are the, the least understood, least financially compensated and overly misregulated industry. And in a matter of three to five years, uh, we'll probably be gone. And uh, despite of that, we are we play a very vital role in declogging our emergency rooms where it costs our state budget so much. And in comparison to how much the state would pay to uh, nursing homes for the same care, they pay like between two hundred fifty to five hundred dollars a day, where we could provide the same care and lodging for at least sixty dollars a day. So, how can you help our industry, our elderly, the most vulnerable citizens of our state, and help our industry at the same time? Given the fact that in, in a couple of years there will be a, tide, a tsunami or a tide of, of, of baby boomers retiring. And our state is considered as a retirement hub. Okay, right. and, and taking that industry out, who would be able to accept for whatever uh, finan financial situation that they have, we know for a fact that most of them will not, will not have uh, uh, a lot of money to afford uh, you know, uh, assisted living type, you know, big facilities and stuff like that. We're the ones who can offer them the alternative housing and care, or can offer for whatever they have, or they're able to, to, to pay on a private pay basis without basically assistance from the state. Okay, so how can you help our citizens and our- Very people? simple. Voting along with Joe Tino 
when he gets elected up to the assembly. Joe and I have spoken about this. To co-sponsor a bill with him. Now, I know firsthand how expensive this can be. Back in 1991, my mother had a stroke. It was a very serious one. And she was going to have to go into skilled nursing because they would have to put a feeding tube into her. Mm -hmm. And I started going around looking. And this was back then. It was um, the not so pretty places with $7,000 a month. That, that was then 91. The nicer places went eight and 9000 a month. So I know what you're talking about as far as the expenses are mm -hmm. concerned. So uh, Joe's got the fire, Joe's got the, uh, the drive, and the personal involvement in it. And JT, just so you know, Joe Tinio is uh, he's a candidate for assembly. He was the former past president of the same organization uh, Ron had referenced in his question. Yeah. If, I didn't know if you knew his name or his, uh, how he fit into this. Yeah, so. no, I, I, I met you. Okay. After a while, we all get to meet each other <laughs> at the same meet and greets. It's very incestuous at times. So, JT, I'm sorry, uh, Ron's question yeah, to you as well to give you an opportunity. Uh, I, I also very much understand, you know, my parents uh, are both uh, retired today, my mother just recently during the, the height of the recession, and uh, they, you know, th this is an example of two people who did everything. They, they owned their own businesses, uh, they were successful businesses, they, they went to college, they did everything they were supposed to, saved their money, you know, made investments. Um, but because of uh, uh, an unexpected illness and just a poor uh, fate of timing, uh, they, they pretty much lost everything during the recession. They lost uh, their home, they lost their business, and uh, had a lot of trouble dealing with the medical expenses. Luckily, um, my mother uh, had turned 65 just in time to find out that she had cancer and Medicare and Medicaid and help out a lot of it. But because they were wiped out because of that, they are not, I mean, they, they're living off of fixed income now, and they are not in a position to be able to, I mean, fortunately, they're still out of moving and they're in good, good health, but they, it, they couldn't go into an assisted care facility. They couldn't go into a retirement community right now. They couldn't afford it. Right? And they, and so <laughs> the price is a big concern to them, and I definitely sympathize with that. And, you know, this is a conversation that, I would like to sit down with you and, and have a, a more in-depth conversation because I, I'm not aware of those specific numbers about the price point, about how you, how you said we can save them some money. <coughs> and I would really like to look into that because if we can, if we can do anything to help our seniors out of that, you know, make sure that that uh, their living expenses are much more affordable for them. I mean, that's something that we need to really take a look at. <laughs> We're coming right up against our time. Does anyone else have any, well, any last question for these gentlemen? Kevin? I'm very much in the educational issue. If so, you were elected. Will you support some kind of more ethic classes or teaching in the pre or grade school? I believe that's where our problem all began. My kids were born here, they were raised here, and I see a lot of stuff, a lot, a lot of problems in the school. <coughs> now every other <coughs> assembly person is saying, well, you know what, some say we need money in school, <coughs> and some say, well, okay, we need better teachers. But when you have kids cussing at you, not respecting the teacher, who'll give a damn? And then the teacher say, the parents gotta teach it. The parents say, no, I'm busy making a living. The neighbors say, that's your problem. That's our society. Nobody give a damn. Parents got to make a living. And like you say, it's getting harder and harder. Both parents got to work in order to survive. Or poor. No matter what, 98% 90, of the population were poor. So, if you were to be elected, will you support and drive on the issue that our young 
have to be taught with more education, more ethic education, whatever it works out, but it have to be done. What I would like to do, and this would go out like a lead balloon, is create a luxury tax for education. For instance, if you're going to buy a $50,000 boat, you're going to buy $100,000 jewelry, raise the sales tax 2 or 3% more. If you can afford to buy, expend that kind of money, you can then afford 2 or 3% more. I don't know what the exact numbers are, but it's a concept. And that money should be earmarked for specific uses. And for the, uh, and for the uh, education wise? You know, uh, it, it, it's interesting that you touched on that point because uh, I, I think that there's one lady in particular I talked to who was a teacher, uh, and, and she was saying exactly what you, you were saying, that she's got a class of 30-some kids, and uh, they only want to cooperate. She can't control them. The parents aren't engaged. You know, she's like, I'm, I'm doing everything I can out here. What do you, like, what do you expect me to do? And there's a whole lot of things. Kids, everybody, everybody's to blame, but uh, nobody wants to step up and, and, and work together to fix it. And I think, uh, I, I think that there is an opportunity there, and that if we can just take a, a broad scope and look at it, and, and you know, I think that that's a very compelling idea. Talking about ethics in the classroom, I mean, we should look at curriculum. We should look like uh, how we are we preparing our students for success, because in a lot of cases we're not. That's where a lot of the problems arise. You know, when you have, for instance, a, a, a child who uh, may come from an immigrant family, and English is their second language, um, they might get all the way to high school without having fixed some of that barrier. And their response is either they're not involved, they're not engaged, or sometimes they're, they're disruptive because they simply don't understand uh, enough and they don't know how to, uh, they don't know what, what to do about it. And that's because we're failing them on the front end, because we're not making giving them the bit more digital attention uh, that they need. So we have to look at all of those factors. And I think that that, again, comes back down to like what I was saying about the funding formula, about giving, uh, uh, changing it around and having it weighted towards student needs, whether it's uh, ELL funding, whether it's special needs, whether you know, that finding those individual student problems that are the barriers to achievement and, again, help, helping them along the path of success. We know what the problems are. But thank you again for coming down this afternoon.